For one reason or another, even people who have absolutely no clue about quantum mechanics know of this cat, which sits in a box and is in a sense half alive and half dead. It has essentially become a part of popular culture. And to most people, it doesn't even have any meaning. It's just a cat that's in a box and that's maybe dead. And So this video is about what it really means and uh, why Schrodinger came up with the example in the first place and how we can resolve it using today's knowledge. Let's go. This is where Schrodinger's cat was born. A 1935 paper on the state of quantum mechanics by, unsurprisingly, Erwin Schrödinger. He had been one of the pioneers of the field and his main contribution to it, the Schrödinger equation, is the central equation of all of quantum mechanics. However, he grew increasingly uncomfortable with the interpretations of quantum mechanics, with all the randomness and quantum jumping and weirdness, and this turned him into one of its most vocal critics. In fact, that's exactly what this paper was. A complete dressing down of the mainstream thinking about quantum mechanics at the time. With no small amount of cheekiness. Should I mention he was Austrian? And by the way, Schrödinger totally was Austrian. Okay, so Schrödinger's grumpy cat is not clickbait. It's... Yeah, it is clickbait, but it also plays a meaningful role in this video. Legit bait. I mean, it might sound enticing, but it is legit. In the original version, there was a cat in a box together with a container of cyanide that would or would not be broken, depending on whether a nucleus would randomly decay or not. So according to the quantum rules, you would get a cat in a superposition of being alive and being dead. Many people, me included, find it to be unnecessarily cruel and rather questionable. Uh, so there is now an updated version of it where the cat isn't killed but merely sedated. And while this is better, I've always found it a bit lazy. It's a, a change so minimal you can even use the same illustrations. So instead, I've come up with Schrödinger's grumpy cat and it goes like this. Inside a box is a very grumpy cat, together with a radioactive substance that will decay with a 50-50 probability in the given time interval. This decay will then trigger the release of nitrous oxide, also known as laughing gas. So the two possible outcomes will be atom unchanged and cat still grumpy, or atom decayed and cat affected by laughing gas. The entire point of this is that the quantum superposition of the quantum system of the atom is transferred to a large system, to a cat. The cat is forced into a superposition of quantum states, both grumpy and happy. Only when the box is opened and the cat is observed, the superposition will supposedly collapse and give one of both outcomes. Therefore, Schrödinger argued, all this quantum silliness cannot be restricted to the, to the microscopic world of atoms and particles, but it would invariably spread to our world of macroscopic, of large objects too. So in essence, if you want quantum silliness somewhere, you will get it everywhere. So Schrödinger's example raises three objections to the quantum mechanical description of the world. First and foremost, this is weird, this can't be. I mean, this is the almost logical reaction to what quantum mechanics says. But as an argument, it doesn't hold any water. The universe is as it is, and it's not the universe's problem if we find that illogical or weird or displeasing in any way. So people finding quantum mechanics weird is a legitimate opinion, but not an argument against it. Second, where are all the superpositions between macroscopic objects? Quantum superpositions aren't observable per se, but they can create effects, which are. And we don't see any of those in the macroscopic world. Uh, we don't get an interference pattern from a cat or something like that. 
What exactly causes the collapse of the quantum state to a singular outcome? So how and when does a state collapse and what does observation really mean? What, what counts as an observation? So the first point wasn't really a point. And the second and third point can be addressed by a relatively new concept in quantum mechanics, which we call decoherence. The original Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics asserts that there is a hard cut between the quantum world on one side and the classical world on the other, and these play by completely different rules. Nowadays the prevailing notion is that quantum mechanics is universal, so quantum mechanics applies everywhere, and what we call classical mechanics is just what quantum mechanics looks like at our large scale, at our macroscopic world. And one reason why these two worlds look so different is decoherence. The key idea of decoherence is that quantum systems are never isolated. They are always open systems in contact with the rest of the universe, the extremely large environment system. The thing about macroscopic objects is that they consist of an unimaginable number of atoms, between 10 to the 20 to 10 to the 30. Very roughly speaking, that's the same difference in complexity as between you and the entire planet Earth and everything in it. And just like you are constantly interacting with the world around you, you breathe, you perceive light or sound or smell, you emit thermal radiation, your weight pushes on the floor, etc. And in the same way, a quantum system interacts with its environment all the time. In quantum terms, this means that the two systems become connected or entangled just like Schrödinger posited. Information is transferred from the quantum system to the environment, or um, more precisely, into the correlations between the quantum system and the environment. In any kind of realistic setting, these correlations cannot be measured. It, that would be like trying to catch all the air molecules that you breathed out 10 minutes ago. So we only ever have access to reduced information of a quantum state, uh, which is what we call a mixed state. And this is decoherence. Entanglement with the environment and information loss that leads to a mixed state. Mixed states do not contain any quantum superpositions anymore, just classical probabilities to reflect our ignorance of what the state is. This means that the cat is never in a quantum superposition. It immediately takes on a classical state with a classical 50-50 probability, because we don't know which one. This means it immediately takes on the state of either grumpy or happy, even before opening the box, and opening the box doesn't change anything about the state. So in a way this is similar to the process of friction, where energy is taken out of a system and dissipated to internal motion in the environment. And the energy can never be extracted again. So thinking of decoherence as a friction for information is a useful picture. I, um, okay, I have to backtrack a bit. I said the cat would never be in a superposition and that's inaccurate. The superposition does exist, but it erodes extremely quickly. For macroscopic systems like a cat, it happens so quickly that it is literally impossible to measure. So there is an effect that solves our problem, but it happens so quickly that we cannot measure it. Convenient awfully convenient. And that's why initially people didn't take decoherence very seriously. However, when we look at an equation describing decoherence, we first get the normal behavior of all systems, but we also get two additional terms. One describing decoherence and the second describing dissipation or damping within the system. On top of that, we find that these two effects are directly related. And that was the decisive clue for where we could actually measure decoherence. In systems with only small amounts of dissipation. One example of this is superconductors. But a more accessible example is light in a vacuum. Light is dampened by matter, but it doesn't dampen itself. Well, 
except for very small effects like Dalebrook scattering. This means that there are examples where the decoherence times are much, much longer and we can see decoherence in real world experiments. These experiments were done in the 90s and 2000s for photons in an optical cavity and also isolated ions in a magnetic trap. And a round of Nobel Prizes was handed out. So decoherence is not just a convenient idea, it is a real effect that can be measured in real experiments. Okay, so decoherence turns out to be real. This does not mean, however, that we have solved everything. While decoherence is a solution to the cat problem, it is also a problem itself. Quantum computers rely on quantum effects to do their magic. So if a quantum superposition turns into a mixed state due to decoherence, it becomes useless. Hence decoherence is one of the central problems for quantum computing. Also decoherence does not get rid of the fundamental quantum randomness of which possible outcome will be realized. Plus there are still um, many open detailed questions about decoherence itself. Decoherence can explain, however, how a wave function collapses to a mixed state without quantum superpositions through interaction with the environment alone. And that's why we never see a cat in a superposition of grumpy and happy. <laughs>